Hey folks, how's it going? So about two years ago, I bought myself a little 3018 CNC router to learn a bit more about CAM and toolpaths, and I ended up absolutely loving this thing. I use it on almost all my projects, especially after I made some upgrades to let me mill aluminum with it. But now that I have the milling cross slide for the mini lathe, I've been feeling like its capabilities are slightly more limited than what I want out of it. Specifically, even with the upgrades I've already performed, I'm still fighting against rigidity issues. Even though it can cut aluminum, currently the depth of cut on a 1 8 inch end mill is only around 0.1 millimeters. Trying to cut more than that at a time and the machine chatters like crazy, moves around in the enclosure, and tends to produce parts that look like this. I think that with a few changes, this thing can be turned into something much more capable of keeping pace with the other machines in my shop. But before we get to that, let me quickly run through what I've already done to this thing. I have a short on my channel which briefly shows this thing being made, but the gist of it is I replaced the x-axis linear rods that were originally used to support the z-axis gantry with some MJN12 linear rails, and then created a new z-axis gantry that also uses linear rails and can hold on to this Makita router rather than the original spindle loader. Okay, that's the 10 second summary, and now that you have the background information, let's go through the issues with this thing. I think the main rigidity issues are caused by three things. Firstly, as I'm sure you've noticed by now, there is a lot of 3D printed stuff on this machine. Because of the way I have this designed, I think this one is the one that's actually causing the most issues, so we're going to have to replace that with one that's made out of aluminum. Secondly, the Y-axis here has a shocking amount of flex when any torque is applied to it, so we're going to need to reevaluate how that's supported. And lastly, when pushing the machine to do heavier cuts, it has a tendency to vibrate and move around in the enclosure. So, to recap, we need to remake some of these 3D printed parts out of aluminum, we need to stiffen up the Y-axis, and we need to add a bit of extra weight to the machine. Should be easy, right? First things first, let's get to work on making the aluminum parts that we'll use to replace some of the 3D printed components. And like I alluded to when I was pointing at the machine, we'll specifically be making these components here to replace the existing backplate. To get things started, I began cutting out the rough shape of the components I needed with the portable bandsaw from some stock material that I had lying around. Doing this, I quickly realized that I absolutely suck at cutting straight lines with this thing, and decided I was going to have to unportable it and get it mounted to a table so I can get a more accurate cut. So we have the materials cut roughly down to size, and off camera I went ahead and JB welded an extra bit of material onto the stock material that we cut out of this, just because this isn't quite thick enough to make the parts that we need. Taking a look at all this from a manufacturing perspective, we kind of have two different styles of parts to machine. There are the spacers that we need to cut out of these, and then there is the back joiner plate that we're going to make out of this. I felt these spacers would be easier to mill by hand, so I broke out the milling attachment for the mini lathe and got to work squaring up the stock. After the stock was square and looking good, I got to work milling the parts down to size, and to make sure I got the parts cut down to the right thickness, I took my dial indicator and mounted it to the lathe ways, and then set the dial to the depth of cut I wanted. I then moved the carriage over until the dial read zero, and hey presto, we have a properly milled spacer that's only half a thou over what I was aiming for. Not bad. Alright, we're about one thou over in thickness, but we can live with that, that's within the tolerances that we need. Now to do basically the same thing to this piece, and get our holes drilled. I decided to treat myself, and got this two-way cross slide vise to use with the drill press, and if you've never used one before, words cannot describe how much better this was compared to the way I used to try to line everything up with C-clamps on a flat board. Okay, now that the back spacers are done, we are good to move on to this back plate, and there's a slight issue that I want to figure out before I go mark and drill the holes. So if you look closely here, there is a significant curve in this piece of stock material, and I'd like to flatten it out a bit just to make everything a little bit more uniform before we go and put work into this. Uh, I don't know for sure what I'm going to do about that yet, but you'll see in a second once I figure it out. I tried to flatten the piece by clamping it against a flat piece of reference steel, but I couldn't get enough force to permanently bend it. I ended up settling on using some sandpaper on a relatively flat board to knock the high spots down. After that, I printed off a drawing based on the CAD model, and used it to mark the center locations for each of the holes that I needed to drill. I then tossed the piece into the drill press and got drilling. Similarly to the last build on my channel, I used drills where I needed a hole, and then came in with a flat nose end mill to make flat bottom countersinks, where it was necessary for them to accommodate the heads of the bolts. The next change to make is probably the most important one, and it's fixing the y-axis to be more rigid using some linear rails. I opted for these super beefy HGH-15s, which are absolutely amazing. They feel extremely solid, 
and they move way better than the MGN-12s that I used on the X-axis. But unfortunately, I couldn't buy them in the right length for the actual Y-axis, so we're gonna need to cut them down, and I hate cutting hardened steel. Uh, the only tool I have that is able to do it is an angle grinder, and I never seem to get it to cut straight, or the metal gets too hot and it just it creates a huge mess. I was looking around for a better way to cut through the rail, and I came across this really cool 3D printed angle grinder cutting guide on Thingiverse. I liked the idea, so I designed one in Fusion for my angle grinder and printed it out. I got it assembled and matched to a piece of scrap wood, and I'd say I'm pretty impressed with how solid this thing feels. I clamped it down and started making the cut into the rail, stopping every few seconds to cool the rail with some water. All in all, the results are way better than what I would have achieved by hand, so I will call this a win. The next component that we need to strengthen up the Y-axis is the bracket that will mount the rail to the router bed. And there were a lot of designs that would work for this, but I ended up just going for a simple 90 degree joint between two plates of aluminum. Possibly not the most rigid, I will admit that, but if I find it to be the weakest link, it's easy enough to swap out in the future. I cut the pieces down from some stock material to size with the bandsaw, and like before, used a printed off drawing to mark the holes that I needed to drill. I then brought the stock over to the mini lathe to square it up and cut the slots into place. Then, just like before, broke out the drill press and got drilling the holes that I had marked out. After I got all the features in place, I 3D printed a few brackets that would hold the plates in position while the cold weld set. Once it did, we're left with a relatively sturdy fit. Okay, final steps, we're going to be adding a bunch of mass to this overall setup, and I think I've come up with a good solution for that. One of these concrete pavers should do the trick quite nicely. It's heavy, it's relatively flat, it's quite rigid, and, most importantly, it's about $6 at my local hardware store. Now, the only thing we need to do is come up with some way to mount this to the bottom of the 3018 CNC router. So, I tossed around a few ideas for a bit, and I believe our best bet is going to be to drill holes in the concrete pad and then use these bolts and T-slot nuts to mount the frame in place. I started off by measuring the concrete pad and marking the hole locations that need to be drilled. As a bit of a sanity check, I placed the router frame on the pad and marked the outer edges of the extrusion just to confirm that everything looked good. After that was done, to get the holes drilled in the concrete pad, I used a small quarter inch masonry bit to bore a hole the entire way through the pad by drilling for a few seconds, then flushing the cut with water to both cool the cut and clear away all the concrete paste that the drilling generated. Then I flipped the pad and drilled about 20 millimeters in with the bigger of the two masonry bits to make a small countersink so the heads of the screws will lie inside the concrete to make sure the pad will sit flat in its enclosure. All right, so our parts are finally done and we are good to get this thing assembled. But the first step in assembly is actually going to be to disassemble the existing structure here. And now, I don't think that's going to be too interesting to watch, so let's just do a quick wipe to when this is disassembled. So all I did was remove the router mount, and I also went and removed the Z-axis gantry. And so all this is is just a couple aluminum rails that mount onto these T-slot nuts. That just slots in right there. So that's where we are, and now all we need to do is get our parts and swap them one for one. And there we go. Smooth transition aside, uh, this was way easier than I thought it was going to be. I had a little trouble when I was attaching this 3D printed one uh, with the rails binding up when I tightened the bolts down too tightly. Uh, this aluminum one, I think because I machined these spacers quite flat, uh, didn't have that problem at all and it was able to move smoothly just pretty well right out of the gate. So, now that part's ready, uh, I think the next step is going to be get our Y-axis rails attached. And I feel like that means it's time for a build montage. So, to get the rails attached, I think that our best bet is going to be remove the front section of the frame and take all the mounting T-slot nuts and bolts and get them partially screwed into the HGH-15s. Once they're in place, we can go ahead and slide the rail block into place, being careful not to drop any of the bearings out of them while they're partially slid on. After that, we can take the assembled rail and slide the T-slot nuts into place in the extrusion and then tighten everything down. Next, I flip the 3018 in its side and remove the existing Y-axis supports and attach the L-brackets into place using the larger T-slot nuts that were previously used for the Y-axis linear bearing carriers. Because the L-brackets extended past the base of the existing frame, I modeled and 3D printed some small feet which raised the base enough for the brackets to clear the surface the 3018 was sitting on. After these were in place, I slid four bolts through the holes that we drilled into the concrete pad and threaded on some T-slot nuts, which brings us to our last step of installing our new parts, which is simply to slide the 3018 onto the T-slot nuts, 
tighten them down, and then reinstall the front frame. Okay, we have all of our new parts installed, and the last thing we need to do is reinstall the Z-axis gantry onto that magic plate. So that's going to simply be done by taking the T-slots here and notching them into our aluminum extrusions. Uh, after that, we should be good to test this thing out. Alright, so assembly is done on the CNC router, everything is aligned, and it is now safely inside its enclosure. So, next thing we have to do is actually test this thing out, and for that I have this little piece of scrap material here, and I went ahead and programmed a 2D adaptive facing cut at 032 millimeters depth of cut, and uh, yeah, let's get this thing chucked in the vise and see what kind of results we get. Okay, so I screwed up the setting of the Z height here. Uh, that's why it did this. Um, but on the bright side, uh, if you look here, there is barely any chatter, uh, despite the pretty extreme depth of cut that that just plowed through. So that's a good sign. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, fix the Z height problem and then rerun my toolpath. Okay, that worked phenomenally well. Uh, I was not expecting it to perform this quite that smoothly. Um, let's add another tenth of a millimeter and see what kind of results we get. All right, and here are the final results. So I did a 0.42 millimeter roughing pass and then came in with a 0.06 mil finishing pass. Uh, and the results are phenomenal. Uh, there was no chatter at all while it was cutting this, and it is completely smooth to the touch. Uh, I know that's a bit hard to show on camera, the aluminum shows all of the, the sins of machining, but uh, trust me, it is very smooth, and I am absolutely thrilled with how everything turned out. I was going to go through and make some additional parts uh, just out of this aluminum plate, you know, replace some more of the plastic stuff with, uh, with some aluminum, um, but I feel like this video is getting kind of long anyway, and I, I don't want to bore you folks, so I might go do that off camera, but honestly with the results that I got here, um, I, I don't actually think it's necessary. Uh, this is you know, way better than I was hoping for. Uh, basically got a four times improvement of machining speed purely by a depth of cut perspective. And that's going to open up a huge number of possibilities of stuff that I wasn't able to machine before. So I'm very excited for that. Um, anyway, uh, I think that's all I want to say. So um, thank you folks for watching and I'll see you next time.